Hello friends, I'm Max and this video is about the construction of my water wheel running off a small stream near my log cabin deep in the woods. Over the past two years, harnessing my water wheel's power output has helped me with a handful of everyday tasks. As you can see for yourself, I use this wheel as a drive for my wooden washing machine, which currently has only a washing cycle, but I have plans to add a spin and rinse cycles to it. And of course, I use the water wheel as a drive for my mini power plant made from a conventional electric screwdriver, primarily for charging batteries for my phone, video equipment, drone, cell signal booster, two batteries, and to a lesser extent for my log cabin's lights at night, when the solar panels are of little use. Quite often, I use the water wheel as a drive for my cast iron mini mill on which I mill grain for homemade bread and pies, as well as coffee beans for making freshly ground coffee, which, once tasted, is so difficult to refuse. Occasionally, I use the water wheel as a drive for my drum type grinding wheel with interchangeable abrasive belts, or as an inertia drive for a wood lathe as well as a drive for my other bushcraft mechanisms designed to free up time, add comfort and just to dispel boredom. After all, the use of a water wheel in an everyday routine undoubtedly adds variety to life, pleases the eye and to some extent even acts as an attraction. Frankly, the very process of the water wheel's manufacturing gave me a lot of pleasure. Without previous experience of constructing water wheels, on top of having to work in a bushcraft setting, this task is not trivial, and now I invite you to join this adventure. Friends, I'm sorry to seem unoriginal, but the implementation of this project began with preparations beforehand. In fact, my previous videos about organizing an open-air workshop described the preliminary stage for the water wheel construction. There were other essential steps that contributed to this project, such as building a topsy-turvy workbench, a primitive tool rack, a shaving horse and saw horses, as well as milling logs into boards, forging a two-handed chisel and a clogger's knife, also other DIY projects, including building a log cabin for that matter. It turns out that even the construction of a dam and a swimming pond on this stream in 2014 was a necessary stage for the current water wheel project. I think this channel's regulars noticed that all my videos are story related. And just like in Chekhov's guns concept, if in one video I hang a shotgun on the cabin's wall, there will definitely be a video where I make a water pipe for a distillation cube or a coil for a tar distillery from its barrel. I drew a couple of sketches of the water wheel and thought of the available materials at the camp. I also figured out what tools I would need in the woods what tools and materials I already have at my log cabin, as well as what critical parts can only be made at my home shop. Having reached the cabin and delivered the main tools and perishable provisions, the first thing I did was prepare the lumber materials for the wheel. Boards milled from downed trees are especially damp and will warp while drying, so it is better to start harvesting wood ahead of time. Initially, I decided that the water wheel's assembly parts would be as simple to manufacture as possible. This means that they should be short rectangular boards, not much longer than my chainsaw's guide bar. I've already used all of the good wind throw lumber around the camp. However, I managed to quickly fill the cabin with short wood pieces transported on my homemade pack frame. One can easily carry a heavy load through difficult terrain using a pack frame. While the lumber was drying and warping inside the log cabin, I prepared two workbenches. One made from a falling pine has warped last year and had to be leveled this season. And the new workbench made from a log, which I named a topsy-turvy workbench. The flat workbench's countertop with bench dogs allowed not only to secure the workpiece, but also to quickly evaluate the workpiece's geometry. Now I am flattening the workpieces the second time, as when I finished jointing the last piece, the first ones dried and warped some more. They could be restrained simply by wetting. After all, the wheel will be partially submerged in water, 
but I was afraid that the wet work pieces would not accept an oily finish well and mold. So I flattened the entire set of work pieces. I didn't perfect the board's surfaces with a smoother plane, but only rough shaped them to the needed size with a scrap plane. The scrap plane's blade has a semicircular cutting edge for more aggressive material removal. This is why a scrap plane leaves a smooth but wavy surface that can easily be smoothened with a regular plane. My thoughts were that the water wheel is not a fine woodworking, but rather a carpentry project, so the wavy wet surfaces would glimmer nicely in the sunlight. Also, they would give the water wheel the charm of a handmade product. In this footage, you are looking at the already laid out, pre-drilled and countersunk work pieces, which means that I'm planing them for the third time. However, this fine-tuning procedure is not about correcting a board's cupping or twisting. These particular work pieces turned out to be a bit thicker than the others and would create a noticeable discontinuity in the final assembly. So I planed the work pieces' faces with a scrap plane by securing them on a workbench. However, jointing the work pieces' side and end grain surfaces would require a shooting board jig that I don't have. So I decided to use my topsy-turvy workbench that allows to secure a board vertically using DIY bench dogs and hold down clamps. This time I used both a scrub and a smoother plane along with a tri-square to properly joint the board's edges. I like to work with wood using well-sharpened tools. I like everything about it. The rustle of wood shavings, the smell of wood, the tactile sensations from touching a smooth planed surface. In this project, I planed wood to my heart's content. I could barely keep up with the process of burning the shavings in my campfire. Back home, I made a trapezoid MDF template. Using it, I laid out the contours of the side pieces that form the wheel's rim, as well as the locations of the screw's mounting holes. Note that I'm trying to use straight-grained hardwood and discard the sap wood, nuts and other defects. Over the years I began to consider sap wood as a defect in pine wood. Using an axe, you can predictably split a hardwood board to size with a small allowance without risk to mess it up. An untidy board's edge, after having been split by an axe, can be smoothened with the scrap plane in seconds. At this point, I had satisfied my hunger for manual wood planing and decided to switch to earthwork. There is a stream with a waterfall and a dam, but there is no room for a water wheel on the stream. The situation has to be addressed. In previous years, I removed the debris from the dam side, or rather just sawed off and moved dry branches up and down the stream. Now it is a high time to complete the job, but first I need to scythe the meadow sweet. There are ticks and snags that hide in the tall grass, so it is important to be dressed properly for the job. As a bonus, by scything the grass in the area, you can noticeably reduce the number of mosquitoes, gnats and other insects that are hungry for your blood and flesh. A little further downstream, there is a 10 foot, 3 meter high waterfall where a large water wheel may fit well. It could be up to 26 feet, 8 meters in diameter if a forward rotation design is used, or even close to 40 feet, 12 meters with a more popular reverse rotation design. Are you thinking what I am thinking? My water wheel under construction is 10 times smaller, but the height difference immediately behind the dam is still not enough for it. I don't want to build an aqueduct longer than 10 feet 3 meters, so I need to either build up a dam or deepen the bottom of the stream. It is more rational to move large boulders down the stream, while small stones can be thrown in any direction, but it is wiser to throw them closer to the dam. They will serve as good material for strengthening and building up the dam after all. If you look closer at the dam, you will notice that it was made briskly as a temporary structure. Eight years ago, I simply moved some branches and stones down the stream to create a small swimming pond. In subsequent years, I added more material to the dam and now it would be good to fully rebuild it, but I was too lazy and decided to just strengthen it. Once again, I was glad that I had brought the trenching tools to the camp. Digging gravel with a spade is not effective. 
but if you first remove large rocks with your hands, it works okay then. I understand that without a sealant, the stones that I put in the dam's base will not add air tightness to it, but I did not intend to do this in the first place. From this digging, I solved two problems. First of all, I removed the soil from the stream bed, thereby freeing up space for the water wheel. And secondly, I reinforced the dam, which protects it from the destructive effects of spring floods. Standing barefoot in cold running water is pleasant and invigorating, but it is time to take a break from earthworks and return to woodworking. I intend to make two products from this rotting trunk of falling pine at once. The first will be the wooden gutter to deliver water from the pond to the water wheel's blades, and the second product will be the water wheel's octagonal shaft. So after hanging the log on supports and securing it with the log dog, I roughly trimmed its ends while assessing which side of the log rotted more. Then I sawed off the rotted exterior wood, leaving me with not that much lumber. The second and the last exterior slabs were laid out and sawed off much more carefully than the others. These cuts will affect the geometry of both the octagonal shaft and the integrity of the wooden gutter. However, the next cut is even more crucial because this is a partial cut. If it is not done just right, the gutter will leak and some water will miss the water wheel. Given that my stream's power isn't that great, I have to maximize the flow of water passing through the water wheel. So I carefully controlled the depth of the cut with the tri-square. The last fourth cut is the most difficult, because you have to cut a log in an unstable position. Therefore, I added two additional stops to the supporting pads. This is a partial cut too, and according to my calculations, it should connect to the third cut inside, creating a wooden corner and a square beam. If you want to learn more about my freehand milling technique with a low power chainsaw equipped with stock guide bar, I will refer you to my video, Two Chainsaw Secrets Turning a Tree into Perfect Boards. There will be a link to it below. The chainsaw is not a precision tool, and fearing to make a through cut, I decided to complete the task with my DIY two-handed chisel. By the way, these are the same wedges that were used to raise the cabin's door header along with the whole roof. Having inserted wedges into cuts from both ends, I managed to achieve the necessary internal tension in the workpiece. Then, by carefully lowering the chisel into the cut, I chopped up the residual wooden fibers, connecting the rectangular beam with the rest of the log, and they safely separated. The beam, which was cut entirely from the log's hardwood, turned out to be nice and straight, but I put it aside for the time being and began to work on the wooden gutter. I hoisted the workpiece onto the workbench, made of a falling pine, and secured it. The cylindrical outer surface of the gutter makes it difficult to secure. I did not like the surface left by the chainsaw and decided to finish it with a scrap plane. This vintage scrap plane is a present from a friend. Alex, thank you again. This is German quality at its best. I understand that it is not necessary to plane the gutter's inner surface, but forgive me my weakness for smooth planed surfaces. A smooth wooden surface is safer, less absorbent and more rot resistant. What remains is to fine-tune the contact surfaces of both gutter workpieces and then connect them using a reliable but simple way. I decided to use screws, knowing that 99% of the water that gets into this gutter will flow from the dam to the water wheel, which is good enough for me. However, the reliability and durability of such a console mount is questionable. So I reinforced the structure with two wooden dowels acting as spreaders. By the time, I had not yet built a bow lathe, as you might have seen in the previous video, so I had to size the dowels to the right diameter using a plane and a caliper. If you look closely, you will notice an extra pair of holes in the gutter. I missed the mark a little and the counter holes were not coaxial. As a result, I could not drive the dowel in. I had to plug the unusable holes and drill new ones. Even when the holes were drilled right, 
it was not possible to match the end of the dowel with the second mating hole with bare hands. So I used the lever for help. Ok, the spreaders are installed. As a result, the cantilever structure was transformed into a closed one and gained rigidity. Perhaps it would be faster to cut three boards from this log and assemble a simple rectangular gutter from them. But then additional time would have to be spent on sealing the joints and there would be no additional hardwood beam. Most importantly, the gutter would not have the same aesthetic appearance of an untreated log and it would fit worse into the dam's landscape. Back at the dam. I decided to take a break from working wood by doing more earthworks. Fortunately, you can actually relax from that switch, because completely different muscle groups are involved in this activity. All the sand that I poured on top of the dam last year was washed downstream by the spring flood, but large stones and the dam itself remained in place. The washed away sand is clearly visible against the background of blackened stones in the stream bed. Traditionally, a roughly put together log frame filled with rocks becomes reliable gutter support that will not be washed away by a flood. But for my project's scale, I could do with two short logs that are shaped to fit the rocky bottom for extra stability. These logs are so long for the reason that they will support both the wooden gutter and the water wheel itself. And for greater stability, it would be good to reinforce these two logs with perpendicular member. Using tenon cutter attachment, I milled the round tenons and then drilled the mortises for them with the force in a bit. The joints ended up having an extra tight fit, and it took a little of my mallet's persuasion to fully put the H-shaped structure together. It turned out to be very strong, I'm quite satisfied. Now we can install the wooden gutter, resting it with one end on the dam and with the other on the H-shaped support. This fitting task proved that it was time for a meal and contemplation on how to seamlessly make the dam and the gutter together. After lunch I went for a short swim that cheered me up, then changed my clothes and decided to warm up with a scrub plane in my hands. I couldn't wait to start assembling the wheel, and to do that I had to prepare a full set of work pieces. It would seem like a simple task to make a set of identical short boards, which it would be if I had one long jointed board of uniform thickness. But when you have a bunch of short pieces of different dimensions, it takes time. It is also less convenient to immobilize and handle short boards than a long one. I planed the secured short pieces on my topsy-turvy workbench, which made me glad I took the time to make it. At the end of the day, I laid out the mounting holes. When drilling the holes, a countersink with a stop ring helped me. Now I have all of the holes countersunk to prevent the screw caps from protruding beyond the dimensions of the water wheel. The next day, it cleared up again and I happily returned to carpentry work. Fortunately, the workplace was prepared yesterday and there is no need to be distracted by its organization. I had to reject and replace a couple of yesterday's short work pieces. Then I finished the long work pieces. I also made four wooden wheel spokes. This is a board with two rectangular cutouts on the screen. Lastly, I marked the pieces before applying finish on them. Now that the complete set of parts for the water wheel ring assembly is ready and is drying up in the shade, I needed to prepare a large and flat assembly table as my narrow workbenches wouldn't work. The final assembly is not as trivial as it might seem. It may not be possible to assemble a water wheel of my design unless the work surface is fairly flat. I assembled temporary structure from two massive sawhorses and three black older slabs, which I milled last year. Looking back, I know it would be better to flatten the slabs, but I was trying to save time. At least I have aligned the working surfaces of the saw horses in one plane. I did not want to flatten the slabs now, because I have big plans for them. I'm going to use them to make a bed for the cabin. The 2 inch thick black older slabs need to finish the drying process for another year or so, while I'm deciding on the bed's final design among other things. 
the sun came out, which means it is time to apply a protective finish to the water wheel's parts. I first applied a layer of oil-based antiseptic and waited until the antiseptic was absorbed into the wood. It was warm outside and the wait took no more than an hour. And then I applied an oil wax mix, which dried up only the next day. The wax is almost colorless and did not noticeably change the color of the pine wood, which remained light yellow. Now the wood will be protected from fungus and rotting. In winter, the wheel will be stored under a roof, but in summertime it is open to all winds and rains. After two summers of use, the water wheel has not dried out and still looks almost new. I'm happy with the finish. The most awaited moment of this adventure has come. The moment of assembly. Are you excited? I know I am. As you know, proof of concept is a realization of an idea in order to demonstrate its feasibility. I have not seen such a water wheel design anywhere and I'm not entirely sure it will work as intended. The conceptual design and the actual assembly brought to life are two different worlds. It can happen that the designed parts may not even assemble into a wheel. During any complex structure assembly, some errors are almost inevitable, especially when you're manually assembling a structure in the woods while being distracted by mosquitoes. When assembling multiple handmade parts into a single closed symmetric structure, errors will inevitably accumulate and I used the life-size drawing in order to verify the product against it. This way I could detect the accumulated error in time, make an adjustment and get a chance to fix the matter. For example, while fitting only six parts together, it is easy to see that accumulated error exceeds 7 mm, which means that the complete sidewall with a total error of 14 mm will not fit on the already assembled closed ring. This is unacceptable. As a result, I had to disassemble it, correct the layout and reassemble again using the new layout. Such procedure had to be done several times. By evening I got the hang of it and assembled a six segment half ring in just five minutes. As practice has shown, it is not advisable to sequentially assemble more than six segments at a time, as it is much more convenient to close the ring structure by connecting two halves that were fit to size. The design solution, when each water wheel's blade is connected to two adjacent ones, forming a closed, almost cylindrical surface, is both functional and elegant. The downside is it requires precision in execution. When all 12 segments assembled into a single structure matched the drawing, I gained confidence that everything will work out. So far, the structure is not rigid. However, adding more work pieces will dramatically increase its strength. Please note that each part is connected to three adjacent ones at two attachment points. This ensures the rigidity of the attachment, saves materials and minimizes installation operations. Each blade is connected to six trapezoidal segments with 14 screws, two screws per segment. There is not a single loose hinge in the design. At the moment, each blade is connected to the adjacent one by only one screw, allowing for more final tuning. But once one side made of the trapezoidal segments is fully mounted, it is time to secure and align the blades in one plane by installing the remaining screws into the blades. As you may have guessed, using these nails, I properly oriented the most stubborn blades and forced them to take a symmetrical position along the outer radius of the wheel before installing the remaining screws. It is gratifying to see that the most important part of this project resulted in success. It will be much easier to assemble the second rim. I can finally breathe a sigh of relief and take a break from driving screws by switching to another task. But for now, I'd better protect the water wheel from rain inside my log cabin. So I equipped myself with a chainsaw for my new task. I need an octagonal shaft and only yesterday, when building a wooden gutter, I milled a blank for it. This is a four-sided hardwood core from a log. I have already trimmed it in such a way that the beam would have a square cross-section. That is, I tried to make all four sides to be equal and all four angles to be right. Then I laid out the beam. 
Now the number of beams edges must be doubled, which means they just need to be sawed off. For the convenience of work, the beam needs to be secured horizontally on its edge. To do that, I turned my workbench upside down. It was named a topsy-turvy workbench after all. Then I secured the workpiece on it in such a way that the cutting plane was vertically oriented. A year later, I made an extra long guide bar for a chainsaw. Using it makes it easy to make long straight cuts. But I did not have this bar at that point, so I used the same freehand milling technique to produce a straight edge that I already mentioned earlier. When the two side edges are removed, it is necessary to turn the log 90 degrees, secure it again and sew off another one. Once done, I proceeded with doing my favorite activity, which is planing the top edge while it is conveniently facing up. And then I sewed off the last edge, turned the log with the non-planed edge up and planed it to size. Such procedure needs to be repeated two more times. As you can see, the matter is not tricky, but I did not have the opportunity to use this shaft for my water wheel. I messed up the shaft's dimensions and it will not fit the pulley without installing a bushing. So I had to put this shaft aside for my water mills gearbox project. The next day I had to walk a decent distance to another windblown log and mill a larger shaft out of it. For the convenience of work, right on the spot, I decided to make primitive sawhorses. To do this, I hammered six spruce stakes into a tree laying on the ground. Of course, I pre-drilled two inch 52 mm holes for them. The dry spruce stakes hammered into such holes are held firmly much more reliably than if I simply hammered these stakes directly into the ground. Perhaps you will say that such saw horses are too low and it is not convenient to plane while standing on your knee. And I would partially agree with you. However, the same planing activity in a new position brings variety. Note how easily and quickly I can change the edge of the octagonal workpiece on these saw horses. I should say it was quite convenient for me to plane the shaft leaning on my knee. The Japanese woodworkers, for example, use their hand planes while sitting. In addition, their planes don't even have handles and they plane by pulling the tool towards themselves rather than pushing it away. Some people say you get a better tool control this way. Actually, the choice of such sawhorse's height was motivated by the fact that I planned to work the shaft with the chisel, securing it with my weight. I used the chisel of the same width as the wooden spoke. I need to make four long mortises for four wooden spokes. As you understand, this task will take a long time. Fortunately, this work is not tiring, but rather pleasant and even meditative. When you do such a primitive mechanical work, you can meditate about anything. I was thinking about the question of how to organize the wooden gutter dam junction. An experienced woodworker must have noticed that I'm not an expert in using a chisel, so I will not comment my actions. In the meantime, take a moment to rest from my voice. I'm sure I have tired you by now. Okay, I hope you had enough time to take a break from my commentary. Working pre-drilled grooves is faster, but the work loses its meditativeness. Between the third and fourth mortises, I walked to the dam and measured the exact center-to-center -center shaft support's distance. It turned out that this octagonal workpiece has a fair amount of extra length and there is no reason to drag it to the camp, so I sawed it down to size. The shaft should be protected with the same oil wax mix since it also needs to live under the elements. As long as the weather is good, the wheel assembly can continue outside. I will say a couple of general words about the water wheel's design. 
it is easy to see that the wheel is assembled from only two kinds of work pieces connected with overlap joints. A total of 12 rectangular and 24 trapezoidal work pieces make up the wheel. That is connected to the octagonal shaft by four rectangular wooden spokes. As far as the water wheel's size, I wanted to build the most efficient water wheel I could lift and move at least 60 feet 20 meters, which is the distance from the dam to my log cabin. I forgot to mention, I pre-drilled all of the holes to prevent splitting. As a result, after two seasons of use, not a single water wheel's part cracked. I think this is a testament to the design's viability. I didn't additionally seal the cone-shaped water scoops, even though water will inevitably leak through the gaps. However, this will not have any effect on the productivity of the wheel. Well, the hardest part of the project, the wooden wheel, is finished. Now it is necessary to ensure that the wheel can properly rotate around its axis and transfer this rotation to the shaft, for which it is necessary to connect the shaft to the wheel with wooden spokes. Fortunately, all the parts are in stock. So I laid out and cut the spokes mortises on both the shaft and the wheel's inner surface. There is a Russian proverb, originally referring to carpentry, measure seven times, cut once. Therefore, I fitted the parts together many times before assembly. The first fitting showed that the spokes should be secured to the shaft first. The second fitting of the shaft with the secured spokes made it possible to do the precise layout and fine-tuning. This is an important step, as the amount of the wheel's radial runout depends on it. The shaft and the wheel are not perfectly concentric, so in order to compensate for this manufacturing error, there will be four custom-made spokes of slightly different length. Now the wooden spokes are shortened, each to its own size to fit its own mortise. In other words, they are not interchangeable. Note, there are planks to the left of the wheel, next to the mallet. I plan to use them as fasteners to screw the spokes to the inner surface of the wheel. Oddly enough, they were not used. The four-spoke shaft installed so tightly inside the wheel that I decided not to add additional fasteners now, but to install them later when the wheel is dry or it gets loose. The wheel worked for two seasons and neither dried out nor it got loose, so the fasteners never ended up getting installed. A year later, during the modernization of the wheel into the flywheel of an inertia lathe and then into a sharpening wheel, I disassembled and reassembled this shaft spoke joinery and was quite surprised at the absence of any loose joints. There should have been some play here as the whole assembly fully dried out, but there is none. I'm at a loss to the reasons for this phenomenon. Even assembled with the massive shaft, the wheel can be lifted and carried by one person. This works well to one of the main objectives. After trying on the wheel on the spot, I could finally decide on the design of its supports, as well as about the way of organizing the intersection of the wheel to the gutter and the gutter to the dam. This requires wooden blocks, but this time I used up all of my high quality pine that was wind blown near the camp, so I used whatever materials that were left around. This log's sapwood is rotted, but its oily hardwood is still intact and suitable for use. Directly from this block, I need to mill three thick slabs or beams. As you can see, I did not use any preliminary layout, as the dimensions are not that important, as long as their two faces are parallel to each other and perpendicular to the third one. The fourth face may remain as is. Having casually planed this semi-beam, I put it aside and made another one. This workpiece's size and shape is even less important, therefore I used a piece of a falling aspen. I just needed to add this wood piece to the dam, the material of the product can be neglected. So I sawed off three exterior slabs from the log section and fitted this semi-beam to the dam. There are three perpendicular logs that reinforce the top of the dam. I used one of them to attach a cantilever structure to create a hermetic seal that will ensure waterproofing of the gutter junction. I used three rowan dowels to secure the structure. For this, 
I drilled three diagonal holes in the dam's log right through the aspen beam. And then I simply hammered the extra large dowels in, reinforcing the structure. Now it is necessary to create a secure watertight attachment of the gutter to the supporting structure. The rounded outer surface of the gutter does not make the task easy. I made a concave groove in the aspen block so that the gutter's bottom is flush with the bottom of the water channel, so there is no water flow under the gutter. To do it, I used an axe, a chainsaw, a two-handed chisel, a mallet and some ingenuity. Ok, both goals are achieved. Now it is necessary to make the water channel's side walls. The easiest way would be to make them from dirt and sod, but I often use the dam as a bridge and such dirt walls would not hold up for long. This is why I used wooden blocks I could safely step on. Perhaps you remember how I made a wooden ladder to the dam's pond many years ago. I found the rest of that windblown aspen, sawed off a segment of wood from it, slightly longer than the width of the dam, milled a beam from the block and sawed it into two pieces that will become the side walls. Now they need to be attached in such a way that they would form a watertight channel along the gutter's walls over the dam. To do this, it was necessary to trim the beam's ends at the same angle as the gutter's ends. In addition, it was necessary to trim the sod and align the top edges of the dam's logs. At this stage, everything became clear with the gutter installation. It remains to secure the short blocks with dowels and to build up the dam for managing the water flow. Which means I can switch gears for now and return to the assembly of the water wheel. Now I can try on the wheel on its supports and decide how to mount it on the pivot axle. Wait a minute, there is no pivot yet, so the wheel should roll back to the workshop. Disassembling the water wheel by separating the octagonal shaft from the wheel turned out to be more difficult than assembling it. I had to hoist the wheel on the improvised supporting crutches, as I simply could not press the shaft out while the wheel rested on the ground. The shaft had to be carried to my most massive workbench that will need to work as a lathe. The fact is that I need to install pivot pins at each shaft's end and these metal pins must be coaxial so that they don't have axial nor radial runout. Also, because the wheel assembly will rotate on them, they must be located strictly in the center of the water wheel. I don't know how to achieve all of these engineering goals in the bush without using a lathe, so it's necessary to build a simple lathe, or at least its substitute. A workbench made from a falling pine will serve as a foundation for the lathe. So the bed is already there, and now the first step is to make a headstock. This year there will be no spindle in the headstock, but only a primitive wooden chuck to hold a spiral drill bit and then a pivot pin. The center of the chuck should be located above the bed, so that the octagonal shaft clamped between the head and a tailstock could not rotate freely. As you can see, my wooden chuck consists of three holes in the log. One is for a drill bit and the other two are for adjusting wedges. By choosing the side where to hammer the wedge, you can adjust the location of the drill in the horizontal plane. If necessary, you can also make a horizontal hole, and then it will be possible to adjust the position of the bit in the vertical plane. However, I did not find an error in the drill's bit's vertical position and will skip that step. I understand that this wooden chuck is extremely primitive. I didn't make a more advanced clay chuck due to lack of time. I really wanted to get to grinding flour and baking bread from it before the end of the vacation. So there is a head stuck with the chuck. Now we need a tail stock. Directly behind me there is a wind blown log and I can mill two blocks of wood, one of which will be the tail stock. For the convenience of attaching the tail stock to the lathe's bed and the rear spindle to the tail stock, it would be good to mill a groove in this block. Using a chainsaw, this can be done quickly. And the fact that the result is untidy is not important, because this is a single-use part and will do its job well as is. In the tailstock, I need to organize a seat for the octagonal shaft's rotation axis. 
Even though the shaft is heavy, it doesn't experience lateral loads during rotation. So I did not drill a hole, but made a V-shaped cut for this axis. I decided to use a large forcing bit to give rotation to the shaft with a drill. To do that, I hammered the drill bit in the center of the shaft and, being unable to clamp the workpiece between the headstock and the tailstock, secured the shaft on the drill bit using perforated tape and screws. So the forcing drill bit became an impromptu tailstock's life center. Having guided the shaft with one end on the spiral drill bit and clamping the Forstner's bit's shank in the screwdriver's chuck, I started drilling. Perhaps someone will ask, why all these complexities? The fact is that when you rotate the shaft around its axis and drill the workpiece with the stationary drill bit, the hole will be drilled strictly along the axis of rotation. If the axis of rotation of the shaft is located strictly in the center of the shaft, both pivot pins inserted from the shaft's ends will be centered and concentric, preventing the wheel's radial and axial runouts. If you know another, simpler or more reliable way, please share it with me below. I would appreciate it. I drilled the second hole using only muscle strength. To do that, I installed a pulley on the shaft, which I brought from home, and completed the drilling by rotating the shaft directly with my hands. Either way works, but the first one is more fun. At first glance, the result is not bad, but now we need to check everything. First I hammered the pivot pins into the shaft's ends using a homemade aluminum mallet without fear of leaving a nick or otherwise damaging the workpiece. Then I pressed the spoke shaft back into the water wheel. It was much easier to do this the second time. And finally I checked for the axial and radial runouts of the entire assembly. The results of the tests made me happy. Both axial and radial runout measurements are within the desired tolerances. This is my first water wheel. I'll make the next one better. The only thing I improved was drilling the shaft's holes deeper and reinstalling the pivot pins to reduce the shaft's overhang. During these days the wheel must have dried up and it is getting easier and easier to carry it from the dam to the workshop and back. Or maybe I'm just imagining it. Perhaps I've just gotten used to this activity. Well, the wheel is back at its regular place and it is time to return to organization of the water flow. The wooden side walls have to be secured. I drilled two holes in each wooden wall, two counter holes in the dam and joined the parts with Roman dowels. Note, I made two vertical grooves inside the side walls to accept a wooden gate that will regulate the water flow, turning the water wheel on and off. It is probably uncomfortable for you to follow the plot where I do not complete one task, move to another one, and then, without completing the second, return to the first. But this is a true story and the only way to partially reveal my planning method. I believe that the work should not be tiring and the best rest is a change of activity. So when I feel that I'm tired, I just switch to another job or go swimming, fishing, cooking or washing dishes. Work should be harmless and enjoyable and often hard work will do more harm than good. Although, occasionally, in a fit of enthusiasm, it is permissible to perform feats of labor, but only in moderation. At this point, I paused the dam work and returned to the installation of the gutter. The lower end of the gutter must be secured somehow. It would be desirable to be able to adjust the water flow's angle of inclination. The inclination of water flow determines the speed of rotation of the wheel. I already have a cross member connecting the two log supports that can be used for the task. So I can drill a blind hole in it to accept the support without weakening the structure much. I made three pieces of different length that will make it possible to adjust the wheel's rotation without changing the water flow's intensity. The structure is sturdier than it seems. It has stood in the open air for three winters and shows no signs of decreasing strength. As you might remember, I prepared these two quality blocks of wood in advance. They will act as the bearing housings, so I will call them such. They have to be fixed on the log supports. To do that, I made two large niches with vertical and horizontal surfaces to securely install the bearing housings in there. Once they were milled and planed, I installed the wooden housings inside the niches using large dowels to secure them. In order not to get hurt in the bush, I planed the outer surface of the supports with a scrap plane. 
Now I can drill a hole for the pivot pins. Before the first assembly of the entire mechanism, I lubricated the holes with chainsaw bar oil. After the preliminary shaft installation, I will add PTFE plates, acting as slide bearings to minimize friction and improve the reliability. The assembled structure has the perfectly horizontal shaft and the gutter water wheel gap is minimal. It took a dozen of preliminary fittings to get there though. It was not easy to install a massive shaft on both bearings. However, in a hurry I forgot about the pulley. I had to press it on the shaft and reassemble the entire structure. When all of the parts came together perfectly on the first try, I was pleasantly surprised. Before installing the sliding bearings, I hammered in oak inserts into the pivot holes to minimize the pin's side friction and to horizontally center the shaft between the bearings. However, the main friction reduction effect was achieved by installation of the PTFE slide bearings that I milled at my home shop in advance. The wheel is now spinning as if it was installed on two ball bearings, only silently. In addition, such PTFE bearings will not rust or get clogged. I made three sets of them out of fear that they would wear out. I noticed some wear only after two years of the water wheels operation. So now it would be nice to make good use of the water wheel. Let's have this wheel grind some flour now. To do that, it is necessary to install a small manual mill on a rigid platform and add two pulleys, one to the mill plus one to the octagonal shaft, and connect both pulleys with a belt. Friends, small disclosure. In this video, I often use the same electric screwdriver. I'm not trying to recommend this screwdriver or the company, so do not ask me about the model. So I made the mill platform, attached it to a lock support, secured a cast iron mill on it and only hesitated a little while positioning the pulleys. However, my trusted dial indicator helped me out. The problem was the V-belt that I had was defective and had a tendency to fall off. In any case, the water wheel is a machine and precision never hurts in mechanical engineering. The defective V-belt caused me to waste time and over tighten it to improve the reliability which negatively affected the water wheel's efficiency. When I install a better belt, my mini mill will perform even better. While it rains and there is an abundance of water in the stream, I decided to test the dam, the aqueduct and the emergency water discharge system. I plugged the hole in the dam's pipe, closed the gutter's gate and began to monitor how the water level rises. While distracted by lunch, I overlooked the moment causing the dam to overflow. As a result, it was slightly damaged. However, I wasn't upset, it became clear that the dam needs to be built up and strengthened. As a bonus, the flood washed away the construction debris accumulated in the pond during the gutter construction. It will be more pleasant to swim in it now. The good weather has returned, so it is time to pick up a shovel and build up the dam to make it stronger. At the same time, this work will widen the granite embankment. As the dam gets higher, the water level will rise resulting in increasing water flow so the mill will grind flour faster. The water wheel project is a construction project, which means, like any construction project, it should be complemented with landscaping as well. You might remember there is a tree nursery near my cabin. As the tree saplings grow, I transplant them around my log cabin camp. Some trees do not grow fast and remain in the nursery for years, but for example the yellow birch is hardy in the winter grows fairly fast and likes swampy areas. Most importantly, the yellow birch is long-lived, typically 150 years. So I decided to plant two saplings near the water wheel, one on each bank. With the rich silt feeding, the sapling established well and grew quickly the following season. After the water wheel's assembly, I didn't trim its elements in any way. However, the gap between the wooden gutter and the wheel's blades is measured in millimeters for each blade so there is almost no radial runout. After tightening the V-belt, it stopped falling off the pulleys and I was able to load the wheel with useful work. It is pretty sad to live in the bush without bread for 20 days in a row, as it was gone during the first week of my stay. But now my dream has come true, which was that I could work at the workshop near my log cabin while the mill grinds grain for fresh bread. 
Surely, many people will question the effectiveness of my water wheel design choice. For example, why didn't I place the wheel lower, turn it 180 degrees and let the water stream into it from above? essentially making an overflow design. The fact is that overflow water wheels use only a potential energy of water. When the wheel's rotation speed increases, it scoops below the axis of rotation do not perform useful work, as the water splashes out of them under the influence of centrifugal force. At the same time, reverse spinning water wheels are capable of using both potential and kinetic energy of the water flow. So this is why I chose the latter option. I will be grateful for any additional water wheel design ideas and considerations, as I might have overlooked some. Looking at the aesthetic landscape with working water wheel gives me pleasure. It's quite possible it is a self-persuasion. Put the bread baked in my earth oven using flour, milled from grain, grown, harvested, winnowed with my own hands is the most delicious bread that I have ever tasted. Yet, the pleasure of the final result is still less significant in comparison to the pleasure of the process. I could say I envy myself. The water wheel was my old dream and this adventure will have many sequels. Here's a few words about my plans for the future. The water wheel has limitations. For example, changing the wheel's rotation speed and torque is possible only within relatively narrow ranges. However, having cut belts from a tire I can either increase the shaft's speed of rotation or increase its torque with a cascade system of pulleys. And that means I have a lot of interesting opportunities. Can you guess what I'm driving at? At the end of this story, I want to remind you that I made this water wheel primarily for utilitarian purposes. I wanted to use the stream's energy for something useful. As you probably noticed, this was a very long experimental video, by far the longest on my channel. As for me, the video is overly detailed. I could show the wheel building process in about 15 minutes, and the editing would be a lot easier. However, many subscribers ask me for longer videos with more details. I will leave the judgment of this experiment up to you. I am waiting for your feedback. Should this experiment continue, and if so, which of the projects briefly shown in the video should be edited first. Friends, I'm very pleased that you watched almost an hour long video to the very end, which means you found it interesting, perhaps even helpful, and the many hours spent to film and edit it were not wasted. You may have noticed I do not publish my videos often, and even if you subscribe to the channel, you will most likely not receive a new video notification but you can try to set up a bell for all notifications. They say it helps. Additional thank you for sharing my videos with your friends and writing comments. I read all of them. This was Max Igorov, St. Petersburg, Russia. And let good people watch good videos. P.S. Below I left a link to my DIY projects playlist, as well as playlists about my log cabin building, bushcraft projects, kayaks making and outdoor cooking. I hope to see you back on Advoco Makes.